And so we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 14 starts with these words. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth. The dearth. It's a, a dryness. It was a drought. Now, this was a literal dearth. I believe that. But it was also a spiritual dearth. Hard to say. I, I thought about this this week and prayed about it and looked at commentators and nobody was really... Uh, able to say whether he was saying that this dearth is going on now or if it's coming later on. There are some things about it where it makes it seem like it's coming later on. There's also some things that make it seem like it's right now. And Jeremiah's talking about why this is going on. But he starts in verses 1 through 6 talking about this, this dearth. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah according to the dirt, uh, concerning the dearth, Judah mourneth. And the gates thereof languish. They are black under the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. And their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads, because the ground is chapped. For there was no rain in the earth. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. Yea, the hind or the deer also calved in the field and forsook it because there was no grass. And the wild asses did stand in the high places. They snuffed up the wind like dragons. Their eyes did fail because there was no grass. All, they, all the, the mountain goats, the donkeys, the wild donkeys would go and they'd sniff and they'd smell for any kind of grass, any kind of water. Just it's all they could do is smell to try to find something. And things were so bad in this drought that... Uh, I mean, he's talking about how devastating this is. Physical dearth, though, in the Bible, is a result of spiritual dearth, a dryness toward God. And the idea in the Old Testament was God had promised that if you obey the law, I'll send rain, and if you're disobedient, I'll withhold rain. And so there's always this connection between physical and spiritual. Now, again, we can't extrapolate that to us because God hasn't made the same promises to America. When there's a, a drought in Texas... Uh, it's very obviously, you know, climate change. No, I don't know, but um, <laughs> just weather patterns. You know, sometimes there's a drought. There's a drought for a long time, and all of a sudden they get blasted with flooding. And uh, But in Israel, there was very much a connection between the spiritual condition of the people and the physical condition, the rain that came down and uh, would bless them. And the spiritual always precedes the physical. This is a warning to them then. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, Amos says these words, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And as we look at the end of the chapter, he says, Are there any, are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore will we wait upon thee. For thou hast made all these things. He said, yes, true that we look for the clouds. We look toward the heavens for rain. But isn't it also true, Lord, that we look beyond those clouds to you? And if you want to send clouds with no rain, then clouds won't do us any good. And if you want to send rain without clouds, Lord, but above all this, Lord, we need you. We need you. And he feels this dryness. The U.S. finds itself in a similar drought and famine. Not a lack of access to the Word of God. You know, there are countries in the world that don't have any access. They don't have any Bible in their own language. There are hundreds of people groups who, have, who don't have one scrap of Scripture in their own language. Aren't you glad that we have, a, I mean, we have an abundance of the Bible? Yeah. The famine in the U.S. is not due to a lack of access, but uh, a lack of exposure. Gallup poll recently, and this was kind of, it was, a, it was a shocking thing, for the first time ever in all of their polling, found that less than 50% of people of Americans belong to a church. That's the first time it's ever, ever happened. It was at 70% in 1970, it was at 60% in 2013, now it's at 47%, 47% say they belong to a church. Now mind you, that's only people that say they belong to a church. Of course, in America, there was, there was the stigma that if someone asked you, do you belong to a church, you would say yes, even if you never go. Now, 
47% of people say they don't belong to a church. They're, even, they're either getting more honest, or even the people that say they belong to a church and still don't go, it's only 47%. 61% of people polled said that religion was important to them in 2003. Now that number is at 48%. 48% of people say that religion is important. And again, that's religion, Jewish, Muslim, otherwise. 48% of Americans say that. When they asked, how often do you go to church, synagogue, or mosque? 24% uh, of Americans said every week. 9% said almost every week. 11% said once a month. 25% said seldom. And the most, with never, 29% said they never go to church. 29% say they never go to church. 24% said they go every week. Now, that's kind of the way it goes. And again, that's just assuming people are honest. I'm assuming people are honest when they say they never go. And I always kind of, you know, oh, oh, when they say they go every week. So you know the devastating results that what these polls are finding out uh, are showing us. The results are that there's increased crime, uh, increased drug use, uh, depression, suicide is on the rise. And I, are you going to correlate all of that with the, the lack of obedience to the Word of God and church attendance and good Bible pre preaching churches? Absolutely I am. Amen. Yeah, absolutely I am. Right. Uh, righteousness exalteth any nation, the Bible says. And uh, when we're looking for righteousness in areas other than Scripture, of course we're going to have the dearth and the famine that we're experiencing. Now, beyond that, in America and in Israel, we can also get there personally. Uh, how many of you, uh, you raise your hand or don't raise your hand, but just ask yourself the question, how many of you have ever had a period of spiritual dryness before? How many of you, that's been within the last year? I won't ask, how many of you are in one right now? You don't have to answer that. You know, though, there's this dryness that you come across in the Christian life, and it shouldn't be that way, but there's just this apathy toward God, a coldness toward the things of God. There's a famine, a drought in your own life. And the Christian life is theological. It's thoroughly spiritual and theological. And so I'm not going to say what I'm going to say in terms of what you should do, but the spiritual life, what we believe on the inside, the theological, will be expressed in certain Christian disciplines. Now again, uh, we can argue about what those are, but let me give you a small, short list of things that traditionally Christians have believed. And in the book of Acts, you see in a healthy, Christian, vibrant, well-watered church, you'd find things like prayer, right? Prayer that is uh, vibrant and fervent. And when you're in a bit of a famine, when you're in a bit of a drought, your prayer is very distracted. It's, it's hard for you to stay focused in the things that you're praying about. It's hard to want to go to prayer. Um, you, you make requests, but they're generally pretty selfish and not very heartfelt. You're not really burdened about it. You just feel like maybe you're kind of going through the motions. Another is worship. Worship is considering God and considering Him worthy. Now that can be expressed in singing, like this morning. It can be expressed in giving. Like this morning, it can be expressed in gratitude and, uh, and surrender and submission, all those things. But often when you're in a drought, your worship is half-hearted. Uh, I get to, as the song leader, watch the way people sing. And uh, I can, now again, this isn't a foolproof, but I can generally tell when someone's had a good week in the Lord. Right? <laughs> I can tell when someone's kind of struggling. Now again, not across the board, because some people, you just don't like to sing. And that's okay. Some of you feel like you're just glad that the Bible says make a joyful noise. And not like, you know, a, a well-trained one. But I can tell sometimes, sometimes when you're singing, it's kind of like just this. And I'm not making fun of you. I'm just saying, you've had a hard week. You're in a bit of a drought. Worship, it's hard when, when you come to church and you're like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be happy. I'm just kind of, I'm not feeling it. You know, it's half-hearted. Uh, obedience. Um, obedience is a Christian discipline. Uh, when you start 
you're, when you're in a drought, you start to slip into some of those old sinful habits. And maybe they're not overtly sinful, but, you know, they're going to lead to that. You're just slipping. It's not overt. It's not, you know what, forget this. I'm, I'm denying Christ. I'm going to just jump off. No, it's just, I just don't feel like fighting that today. I feel like I, have, I woke up with a bad attitude, and I'm just going to kind of hang on to it. You know, instead of saying, Lord, here it is. I'm ashamed of it, but here it is. Would you take it? Uh, you just kind of slip back into it. Um, scripture reading. When you when you read your Bible, uh, you either don't read it. Yeah, Pastor, it's been a couple of weeks since I really read my Bible. It's a good thing you and Seth do on Sunday mornings, because otherwise I wouldn't get anything. I get that. Uh, or when you read it, you're not really getting a whole lot out of it. Maybe I should pick up one of those devotional books. Maybe that would help. Maybe it would. But I'm just trying to describe what this drought might be. The last discipline is, is community. Now, that's not just going to church, but being involved in a Christian community. And when you're in a drought, you don't really want to be around people. You don't want people asking you how you're doing, because then you have to lie to them. You don't want to you don't want to see other people that are happier than you are because it reminds you just kind of like that I'm really dry right now and I don't want to be a hypocrite and some people when they say well I'm not happy and I don't really feel like going to church and so why be a hypocrite and go when I could just stay home I get that I'm just saying that that's not a good place to be that there's a drought and with the drought comes famine and so God wants to address that this morning and what can we do about this now Jeremiah does the right thing he cries out to God, verse 7, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake. For our backslidings are many, we have sinned against thee. O the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in time of trouble, why shouldest thou be a stranger in the land, as a stranger in the land, and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for the night? Why are we treating you like you're some guy who's passing through? You're the God of Israel. You're our Savior. And we're treating you like you're a stranger, like you're a visitor. Uh, verse number 9. Why shouldest thou be as a man astonished, or astonished, and as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Please, God, don't leave us. We're treating you like we don't want you around, but please don't leave us. That's, that's a good prayer in a drought. Lord, we need you. God, there's no other hope. If I'm going to live the Christian life, it can't be apart from you. There is no Christian life apart from you. Don't leave me. Verse number uh, 17. Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach, with a very grievous blow. If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword. And if I enter into the city, then behold them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into a land that they know not. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah, God? Hast thy soul loathed Zion? Why hast thou smitten us, and there's no healing for us? We look for peace, and there's no good. For the time of healing, and behold, trouble. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Do not abhor us, for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. Now that is the right response when you're in a drought. Uh, the right response is, you know, the root of this has to be sin. It has to be some sin in my life, and maybe the sin of apathy, maybe the sin of prayerlessness, maybe the sin of passive rebellion. Uh, whatever it is, though, get to the root of it and say, God, you know that I don't want to be like this anymore. And the only way is, Lord, I've sinned against you, and I want you to bring me back. Don't leave me. Bring me back to where you are. But of course, that's not generally where we go. We generally try to find some other ways to try to get out of that drought and the sadness that invariably comes with a Christian, a born-again believer in Christ, who's not walking with him. So what, what are some of the things that we do that they tried here and that Jeremiah has some things to say about one of the, one of the temp, attempts to get rid of the drought is just to work a little harder. Verse number three, their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. It's interesting. He says the nobles have done this. Well, who would you expect a noble to send to find water? Servants, right? Uh, or maybe 
some family, maybe some, you know, they're influential, but here they are sending their, their little ones, their children. They're, they're, they're desperate. They're sending everybody out to try to find some water. Imagine some four-year-old child, and he's given, been given a cup by his noble father, and now he's doing the work of a servant because they're desperate. And he goes, and he's looking through the wilderness, and he sees a little dark spot up there, and maybe it's a pit. And so he runs up to the pit, and he looks down, and he's thinking about what it's going to be like when he brings back a cup of water to his father and says, I found a pit that has water, and he looks in it, and there's... There's nothing, it's dry. Even a little lizard scurrying around in there. And he looks over and, and he thinks he hears water and he goes over and, and it's nothing. It's just the wind. And he goes back home and, with an empty cup and says, Father, I don't have anything. You know, but it's this desperation. They've got to try to do something. Now what they could do is say, God, you're the only one who can send rain and there's no rain. We're in a drought. But instead, let's all hands on deck Try to work out this problem. Find some water somewhere. I've got to find some kind of respite for the sorrow that my drought brings. When we're in a drought, it's really easy to start blaming other people. You know, I wouldn't be this dry if it weren't for this other person. Maybe if the pastor preached a little better. Maybe if my spouse weren't writing me like they are. Maybe if my co-workers were a little godlier, it wouldn't be so hard for me. I don't know. Maybe if government, da-da-da-da-da, it's easy to blame other people when I'm in a drought because it's not my fault, right? We say the same thing. We're like, well, there's no rain. What can you do? If there's no rain, there's no rain. Yes, well, when it's, there's a spiritual doubt, the natural state of the Christian is rain. Right? This is what uh, we read this morning out of Isaiah chapter 44. God promises this. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. That's the natural state of the Christian. And if you find yourself there, it's not somebody else's fault. It's yours. And you just need to get back to God. But it's very easy to try to work hard. Like, what can we do to change my circumstances? We, we vow to try to work harder. They've got, there's got to be fulfillment somewhere. You know, if not in church, I tried church, doesn't work. I tried my, reading my Bible. I tried all the Christian stuff. I'm going to find fulfillment somewhere else. And you know, the Bible talks about this, the pleasures of sin for a season. You can probably go find happiness in the world. You can pull up a, 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 some comedy on YouTube and placate yourself for a while and, and dismiss the, the dryness in your soul. But it's not real water. It's not, for the Christian, real growth. It's just a way to kind of kick it down the road. But if we try harder. We try to do something. You know, why is this the wrong way? Ultimately, because it doesn't help. Because you can't get yourself out of drought. If water comes from the heavens, then you look to the heavens. And if, if I'm dry spiritually, there's nothing I can do to change that except cry out to God. Who's the giver of life? Disciplines that I talked about earlier, they are actions, true. But a drought will not end if you just try harder. You know, I'm going to church harder. I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to uh, read my Bible harder. I'm going to do all those things. We'll talk about this in a moment. But uh, all those things are not the point. The Christian disciplines are not the point. You don't start with that. It comes from a heart that expresses itself in love. The, the first step really is repentance. Lord, I have been, I have wandered too far away from you. And what the prodigal son was not waiting for the father to come to him. He went back to the father. It was repentance. It was turning around and saying, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm just going to see if I can get a little bit of something from my father. Well, the, the great news is that when you go back to your father for a little bit of something, he has oceans for you. And I just love that about God. Only God can end the drought. The wrong attempt number two is they try religion. In verse 10, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, they, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet, therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquities and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for the people for their good. They love to wander, and God won't hear them anymore. Still, they try to make amends with God. Verse 12, When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. 
right? So they know that there's something wrong. They've wandered too far. And instead of coming back and saying, God, this was wrong, we're coming back to you, they try to offer sacrifices. Well, let's, God wants sacrifices. He wants us to do the thing where we, whatever, whatever God wants, let's get him off our back. You know who used to do that? The pagans. Oh, Zeus is unhappy. Let's sacrifice a bull on, on and see if he'll send us rain. And God's like, it's not like that. No mean. And whether you offer an offering or not, know me, know my character, know my heart. And if that's not enough, an offering isn't going to do anything for you. Now, isn't it great that Christ himself made the sacrifice for us? There's no more sacrifice. But you know what that means? That means that the way is still back to God. The way is still know who God is. If the sacrifice has been taken away, he's taken away all of your religious acts. And yet, that doesn't stop us from trying Right? Doesn't stop us from trying just a little more religion. Now again, it's the it's the right orientation. It's better than doing nothing or blaming everybody else. It's better than working harder. But it's not enough to overcome sin. Sacrifices will not buy off God. Amos chapter 5, verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days. In Isaiah 1, verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. You think I, I, I like the smell of burning animals? No, I do, especially when it's on a grip. Uh, you know. But is that supposed to please God? Is that supposed to make him happy because you're offering all these things? You think you're buying off God with your actions, with your religious actions? Yeah. Absolutely not. What does God want? He wants your heart. It's always been about your heart. God, in full surrender, God, you know, I don't. You are. I'm not. And so you're everything, and I'm nothing. That's all. That's what the Christian life is. And when you empty yourself, that's when God fills you up. It's interesting, and this isn't in my notes, but it's interesting on that note. If you think about what when, when Elijah went to the widow... In, uh, in Zarephath, in, uh, right outside of Zidon, right? Um, when he went to her, and he said, what are, you, what are you doing? She said, I'm just getting a couple sticks so I can build a fire. I've got a little bit of flour. I've got a little bit of oil. I'm going to make a cake. My son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to die. That's our plan. And Elijah says, very boldly, make me one first. <laughs> Sorry, What? <laughs> There's no first. Like, if I make you one, there's nothing left. She had to totally be emptied before she could be filled up. And remember the story. She makes him a cake first in faith, and the oil never stopped, and the flour never stopped either. And as a Christian, you've got to come to the point where you are completely empty and you're completely surrendered. If you think, well, yeah, you know what? I've been a little dry, but I'm just going to, I'm going to commit to five, uh, you know, I'm going to commit to a half an hour of prayer every day this week. It's been like zero, it's been five minutes, but now I'm going to go, okay, fine. That could be a great thing. But if you think, well, doing this is going to get me favor with God at the end of the week, I'm sorry, you're sadly mistaken. A half an hour of garbage prayer with uh, no repentance isn't going to do anything. You're, you're chucking animals on the altar to no avail. And, and God is, is sick of it. Their attempts will not end the drought, the famine. Delving into religion helps us feel better about ourselves, though. Because here's what happens when I pray. I think, ah, aren't I a good person? I just spent this time in prayer. Ooh, look at me. I'm at church. I must be a good person. All these feelings of dryness and drought, it must just be in my head because here I am in church, right? I'm going to sing these hymns. Now, please, sing the hymns. Please come to church. Please pray. Please read the Bible. All those Christian disciplines. Please witness to the lost. All I'm saying is you don't start there. That's fruit. That's not root. That's fruit. Root is your relationship with God. And it starts with repentance. It starts with God. I've been dry because of my sins. I've been too far out, and I need you. We can pretend that God's happy with us because we're serving him. The more religious we get. We can lie to ourselves and say, well, how could I be dry? I'm doing all these things. And again, we're lying to ourselves. It's the same trap as trying harder. We fool ourselves into believing that we're doing fine, and we'll never get the help we need. There'll never be rain. It's hard because religious things are a part of that health. 
It's a part, again, I, I already said, the Christian disciplines. I, I've never been more vibrant in my Christian walk than when I'm serving the Lord. But I'm just saying, it doesn't start there. I'm vibrant in my serving the Lord because I'm walking with the Lord. I, there's, there's a communion there. And uh, if I'm serving the Lord and there's no communion there, it's hard. It, it's depressing. It gets me down. Those of you who have, who have been in ministry, even for something like children's church or Sunday school or something, you know, it's hard when you're not right with the Lord. I don't mean in a spiritual, theological sense. I just mean when you're not, when you're the Lord, there's a dryness there, when there's a barrier there, and you know it. That's a hard place to minister from. I've been there. I feel like I'm there too much. Just to be honest with you, I feel like I'm there too much. And uh, God has to bring me back. But that dryness, like, I'm not going to be a better Christian by preaching harder, by preaching better. I'm not going to, you're not going to be a better Christian by becoming a pastor, by becoming a Sunday school teacher. Now, again, I think that every Christian ought to serve in some way. I just think if you're counting on that, it's not going to ultimately do anything for you. Actions that are God-oriented and not us-oriented will get you through that. So what's the difference between... Serving the Lord in dryness and serving the Lord in flourishing, in lusciousness, I guess. Is, I don't know what the word is, but uh, in, in, there's a, yeah, I, lush, I don't know. Anyway, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I, it doesn't matter. You understand. What, what's the difference? Well, the difference is when I'm serving God in my dryness, it's about me. It's about how this reflects back on me. I'm a good person because I'm doing this. I feel better about myself because I'm serving. When I'm praying, it has, my prayer has to be a reflection of his worth, not mine. When I'm worshiping, it has to be a reflection not of my emotions about God, but about God himself. And I feel like, again, we, we fool ourselves when we get an emotional response in worship into thinking that we're doing fine. It's, it's like we get a little bit of the, um, we get a little bit of that, that uh, what, what's the, why can I not think of any Adrenaline. No, dopamine. You know, you get that little adrenaline shot. Oh, I must be worshiping because I feel like I'm worshiping. Uh, and, and we lie to ourselves. Uh, when what God wants is that heart First, and that would overflow into worship. When we obey, it again has to be not in our power, but on His. The, the Christian life is one of obedience, independence, trust, and obey. That's the right way that it should be oriented. Uh, what's the difference? It's actions accompanied by right attitudes. Anybody can read the Bible. You know, atheists read the Bible so they can find out ways to make fun of it. You know, they, they can do it's there's no magic in reading the Bible. The magic is when magic. The the work, the spiritual work is when you out of a heart of God, I love you and I want to know you, and I want to know what you have for me, and you open up the Bible and you say, Speak to me, Lord. That's when change happens, but it starts with the right attitude about the Word of God. Again, go to church. I think that's a great thing. But when you come, why are you here? Are you here to check a box? Are you here to look good? Are you here because you'll feel guilty otherwise? Are you here to be a blessing to other people? I want to be used by God to serve and minister in my local church. I want to give a tract because I have a heart for that person to know the Lord. Not so that if someone asks me if I'm evangelistic, I can point to that. And again, it's so easy to slip into that checking the box. I'm, I'm a good person because I've done all these things. Rather than, God, you are worthy of my time Resources and attention, Lord, you're worthy of all of this, and I just, Lord, I love you. That's that's the heart. That's that's where we all want to be. That's where we all need to be. Instead of exercising out of drought, the wrong attempt number three, and this is all, is they just try to ignore it. it nothing's wrong. It's fine. It's a slump. It's it it is it, it, it's nothing. Jeremiah pleads with God. You see, so God says in verse number 12, he's going to consume them by the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, the disease. And so Jeremiah just points a few things out as if the Lord didn't know. Verse 13, then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. So what's he saying? Well, the reason that the people aren't repenting is the prophets are saying everything's fine. You don't need to worry about it. There's not going to be any sword or drought or pestilence. I'm saying one thing and they're saying the other. And God says, 
Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught or nothing, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. Then the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them. Them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Uh, now, the problem isn't just that they were being lied to by prophets, but what God said a couple of chapters ago, uh, the prophets prophesied falsely, remember at the end of the chapter, and my people love to have it so. So here's the thing, you've got Jeremiah on one side, there's a drought, and he's saying, you know what this drought is? It's punishment from God. There's also famine and pestilence and sword coming. And the prophets on the other side saying, this is just a drought. People go through droughts, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. God's given us a peace. He's given us an assurance that nothing bad is going to happen. And the people are like, I like that message. And they go after the false prophets. It's not just that they're being lied to, that people want to be lied to. We love being lied to. We love it. Advertisements know that, right? You love being lied to. You love to be made to feel like you're an honored customer, right? That you're a treasured guest. You love all the petting and all the everything that advertisements do because we love being lied to. And, and so we just ignore the problem, and that's what they're trying to do for, just to ignore the problem. And God says, if you do, it will get worse. See, your drought right now will turn into famine, and your famine will turn into emaciation. You'll be a, 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 a stymied, uh, not a stymied. You'll be a Christian that is anemic. You'll, be, you'll have nothing. And, and years from now, you'll think about the way you are now and say, I used to be a vibrant Christian. I used to be somebody who walked with the Lord. I found prayer very easy. I found just the, the community and fellowship. Where did I go wrong? You went wrong because you didn't address the root of the problem, which is your heart, which is your sin. And, and maybe instead, well, I tried this and I tried that. And again, I know how this goes. I've seen it. I've had it. I see this spiral that when you just say, it's not a big deal. It's just a little bump. Now again, we as Christians, all, we go through these ups and downs in the Christian life. Problem is, that's not where we should stay. And if you don't do anything about it, that's where you'll stay. And, and it's amazing the people, again, that were a part of this church, or were part of, you know, any, they didn't leave this church to go to another church. They left this church and haven't been anywhere and have... I mean, you just watch the degeneration of their lives. And I'm not, I'm not even trying to do scare tactics. I'm just saying, like, when you embrace the drought, the drought is what you have. When you, say, when you ignore the drought, the drought is what you have. If there's going to be any change, if God's going to pour out water on you so that you can start growing in the Lord, there has to be rain from God. And that comes through repentance. You can't ignore it. It's easy to ex ignore spiritual dearth. Spirit, physical dearth, if there's a physical dearth, we can't ignore it because we have to eat, otherwise we'll die. Spiritually, though, Satan just is there with a whole list of excuses of why things aren't really as bad as you think they are. Things, I mean, it's just, don't worry about this. Why are you always thinking about this? You're not like somebody else. You know, look at all the other people that are around you. You're, you're way more spiritual than they are. You're fine. Why are you worried about this? Uh, you're trying the best you can, Satan says. You're just, you're just in a little bit of a dry spell. But as long as you think that's all it is, you'll never get the help that you need. And you need help. When you're in a drought, you need that. You need to go back and say, God, you know what I am and what I've done. And God, I have wandered too far from you. I'm a, I'm a sheep out in the wilderness. And I'm not, going to, I'm not going to find any rivers or ponds or anything worth drinking. God, I need you to come back and get me. And Praise God every time he will. And he does. You just have to acknowledge what's going on in, in your drought. When we are hungry, God, those hunger pains that we have are a gift from God to tell us what we need. And if you this morning are feeling those pains, uh, I'm in a dry spell. This hurts. This is hard. The ground is chapped. That's God as a blessing telling you that things cannot stay the same. 
they have to change. They, that, that if you continue this, it only gets drier. It doesn't ever get better. Right. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen really dry ground that all of a sudden gets rain. It doesn't take very long for those plants to come right up. I mean, one rain and God can change everything. It can be that today, this afternoon, you go home, you get on your face, you say, God, you know what's going on. I know what's going on. I'm sick of this drought, Lord, would you send rain? And he will flood your soul with joy and peace and love and God will meet you. And you can be just as lush as you've ever been in a matter of no time at all. But it has to be that point of recognition where you say, God, I'm in a drought and I can't ignore it any longer. And I can't work any harder and I can't be more religious. God, it just has to be that you come back and get me. That's all it is. It reminds us that we need to get back to him. And God is waiting for you. He has rain for you. He wants to get you out of this drought. And he will if you'll just ask. If you'll just say, God, I'm sorry. I need you. So let's pray through this drought. God, you know, Lord, what